bright lights, never had those before. <laughs> oh, welcome uh, to you all and just thank you very much, David, for inviting me. Um, it's just really an honour and a privilege uh, to be here and be able to, to share with you. Um, yeah, I thought I just wanted to give you a, a traditional welcome and um, I might have to put my clicker down, um, but I want to get that part onto it. So. Typically, when you greet somebody in, um, in Zambia, and this is particularly with the tribe that I work with, um, they greet each, each other with a very respectful mwaiye, which is, literally means you have come through there. And so I want to greet you all traditionally, and then I also want you to respond to me in the traditional way. So I'm going to greet you, and then your response is, mwane thank you mwane. Okay. But as I greet you, I'm also going to be clapping my hands just like this. And then when you say mwane, thank you mwane, I want you also to, to do that. So let's give it a go. Never failed to work so far. Okay. Mwane, okay. Bena Maharangi, Hope Church. Mwane, thank you Ah, you did very well. <laughs> did better than me. <laughs> Okay, so just a brief overview of what I want to talk about. Um, so I just, I'm just going to have a short video clip of who is SIM, um, and then Zambia at a glance, and then I just want to give a few slides of perhaps, perhaps slides that I don't often present, um, but just about my hospital experience and what sort of led me to where I am now. Um, and then just into the current areas of ministry and just sort of at the moment we're sort of a, a three-pronged uh, ministry with uh, foundations for farming, uh, soap making and soya product making as well. And then just to share with you a little bit about the vision of um, the training centre that we've got started as well. And then maybe just a little bit about life further afield than just the work I do. So here we go. So we're going to start with just a short few minute video. SIM exists because we are convinced that no one should live and die without hearing God's good news. Therefore, we believe that He has called us to make disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ in communities where He is least known. Many communities today have the good news of Jesus Christ. But there are still many communities in the world where that good news is not available as a mission, as an organization, as a people who have been called by the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to cross whatever barrier might be that either prevent people from hearing the good news or prevent them from understanding that news when they hear it. We do this in partnership with organizations. We do it in partnership with churches. We work in collaboration with them. And we also do this by facilitating the participation of the individuals SIM is willing and able to facilitate your participation in God's global ministry, in God's global mission, to facilitate you to where God may be calling you to go, irrespective of where you are coming from or where you are going. And our vision, therefore, is to see a witness to Christ in every community where Christ is currently listed you and the church of Jesus Christ among all peoples. So we invite you to join us in prayer. We invite you to join with us, to come with us as we step out to these communities where Christ is least you. Thank you and God bless. That invitation is a, is a genuine and sincere invitation for all of you just to join us in prayer and even in your hearts if you feel that you want to go. So just a little bit about Zambia at a glance. Um, as you probably learnt tonight uh, where Zambia is, and it's actually surrounded by eight uh, nations. Um, and when I first asked God, and you know, it was way back in 2006 really about you know, send me, Lord, I really you know, want to go and serve you. 
And I did put a condition on that, and that condition was that there would be a beach nearby. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, Zambia, and there wasn't too many beaches, although there are, I've discovered that there are beaches actually um, along the rivers and the lakes in Zambia, but those rivers are infested with crocodiles and uh, hippos, so I don't spend too much time at those beaches, none, needless to say. But yeah, just we had the last census last year, and there's a pop new population count of 19.6 million. Um, and where I am in the, I don't know if this thing, just in Kasempa there. Oops, go back. Oh, that was it's me that's controlling that. <laughs> okay, so Kasempa in the green there. I won't click the button. Um, and it's in the northwestern province there, and it's quite um, a small, remote um, population and area there, and the population sort of Kasempa is about 111,000 um, and the official language of the whole country is English but there are about 20 different tribes in Zambia and there are over well, 72 languages spoken uh, in Zambia so they've sort of you know made the official language English <laughs> um, and the local tribe that I'm with are the Kondi people and the local language which you just heard a little bit about before is called Kikondi. So back, way back in 2009, um, I, and actually I'll go back a little bit before that, I was in London from 2003 to 2008 and I was nursing and I'd felt the, you know, the call to missions in around about 2006 and um, the church I was at, I was at an Anglican church in, in London and they had invited a missionary from um, an organisation called Medair and this organisation would go into a, very sort of hard places where a lot of sort of um, relief uh, work was needed. And so when I heard this person speak, I really just felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit back then to, to really go and um, just seek out, you know, God, what, where would you have me go? Um, so just a, I did a few courses and I ended up back home in the end of 2008. Um, and I got an invite to go to uh, McKinney Mission Hospital and I just thought, oh, that's all too soon, I won't. i just ignore that invite. And then a month later, that invite came out again, and I just, oh gosh, you know, I better do something about this. So I applied with uh, SIM New Zealand, and they very sort of quickly responded back and said yes. And so from the time when I first sort of applied in November 2008, by May 2009, I was um, at McKinney Mission Hospital. And I really felt like I'd been like a stone, <laughs> sort of in David's, you know, kind of slingshot, and I'd been catapulted um, across into the mission field. But um, I spent my first six months there working in a paediatric ward. Um, yep, and a paediatric surgical medical ward. And it was while I was there that I saw um, this program with malnourished kids. And in this program, we would actually go out into the communities and identify and look for children that were at risk of malnutrition. And so we'd visit the rural health centres, um, and from each sort of clinic, we had to sort of enrol about 100 children who had been or had been identified as at risk of malnutrition. We would take along student nurses with us and just the local and local staff, of course, and they would just give a lot of education about, you know, how to give good nutrition to their children. Um, so it was a great sort of education experience for the student nurses as well. Um, yeah, and of course we got to go to the most craziest remote places that you could think of. So that kind of led me to think about, you know, because in this program that we did, we were doing the nutrition, we would actually de um, deliver seeds that we, for the people to cultivate. And these seeds were like soya beans, uh, peanuts, and just beans. And these seeds are actually rich in protein. Um, and so we got to visit the farms as they were growing the, these seeds. And, you know, I just really got to see that the, the, just the poor quality of, of farming. And, um, and I just really felt that God was leading me um, to this different ministry, which I found out to be Foundations for Farming or even Farming God's Way, which is otherwise known. So when I, that was in 2011 to 2013, I came back to New Zealand for a couple of years and in 2015, um, I went back out to Kasempa just with a completely sort of fresh vision, um, yeah, fresh dream to, to start a new ministry. And so, started this um, sort of a project called um, Kasempa Foundations 
And it was really li linking sort of the agriculture and nutrition and hygiene um, and discipleship and all four to bring transformation into people's lives. So the areas of ministry um, that um, we've sort of like developed over the last sort of seven years is, of course, uh, foundations for farming. Um, the nutrition side of things is through a, a, a program uh, or just through a lady called Mama, Hy Mama Soya. And then hygiene, which is uh, Mama Hygiene, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that. And then what's come out of that also as well is micro-enterprise opportunities just surrounding nutrition and uh, hygiene. So firstly, I just want to share about Foundations for Farming. Um, it started off in Zimbabwe, so it's an African-born ministry, which is fantastic. Um, and we, as we go into our teaching programs, we start off with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we give the opportunity for, for people to respond to Christ. Um, and then we move on to the importance of being faithful uh, with the things that God has given us. And for a farmer, the things that God has given a farmer are the sun, the soil, the seed, water, just simple things. It's not uh, things that they haven't got, it's actually things that they have got. Um, and the importance of giving, it doesn't matter what you know, little that you've got, st we're all still able to give something. So we encourage the farmers, and whether it just be their time or energy, even just the knowledge of the things um, that they know of, how to, you know, their own knowledge that they have, those sorts of things we just you know, say, give of yourself, you know, like, give and it shall be given back to you. So we want our farmers to, to make a profit. There is no point in not making a profit. Um, if we don't make a profit, what do we end up doing? We, you know, we have to borrow or we have to beg or perhaps it worse still, you know, we have to steal. Um, and Brian Oldreaver, who's the founder of Foundations for Farming, he said that to make a profit, you need to do four things. You need to do everything on time, to a high standard, without wastage and with joy. And he said, it doesn't matter what enterprise you're in in life, if you do everything with those four principles in mind, you'll make a profit, you'll be successful. And with the, um, the youth on Friday night, I shared with them, you know, if you want to do well in school, you know, <laughs> you, you, you can't just rock up to school late or you can't hand in your assignments late. Um, so it was just something, those four principles you can apply, you know, in, in many areas of our lives. Um, and then the actual sort of technology that we teach is conservation agriculture, which I'll go into a little bit. So we use this model of a house, and you can see the house has the foundation of Jesus Christ, um, has the walls uh, on time, high standard, without wastage, with joy, and it has a roof of the technology and the pillars of faithfulness and giving. So this is just a, a sort of a bit of an example of it in, in our training session here. Um, where we, what the first thing for conservation agriculture we teach is uh, no ploughing, minimal tillage. So you can see here that we teach about digging holes and this is actually a lot less labour intensive than ploughing the fields which they do. Um, we also encourage to cover the ground and we call that in uh, Foundations for Farming, we call it God's Blanket. And the benefit of, you know, when we do mulching here in New Zealand, don't we? but just suppresses the weeds, stops the evaporation, stops the soil runoff. Um, there's so many benefits to covering the ground with leaf matter or, or grass matter. Mm. And the, one of the other principles for conservation agriculture is um, crop rotation. So typically throughout Africa, what you see is maize, 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 maize. And eventually that destroys the soil and um, and then what the farmers have to do, they have to give up on that piece of land and then they have to move to another piece of land because they've acidified that soil just through overdosing of, of, of fertilisers. So we teach the importance of changing your crops, of going from maize on one side and then going into what we can see here is soya on your right and uh, pigeon pea, uh, which is just a new thing we're experimenting with at the moment. Maize and soya is a typical, well, especially soya beans, it's the second most common crop that you see. And what developed out of 
with encouraging farmers to grow soya beans is that most farmers will sell the, the soya beans, but actually we, they can use it, they can hold it back, they can use and cook with it and help provide their families with good nutrition. Just a couple of other areas that we do uh, teaching, one in compost making. Now compost making is just a beautiful analogy of what God can do with our lives and um, you know, just the rubbish stuff, you know, that they would probably just want to burn and throw away, you know, like the leaves and the grasses and all, everything. You know, we teach them how to make compost manure. And that pile that you see, um, we've just freshly made, and every week we turn that pile. And about the end of eight weeks, what you find is um, that we just have like maybe a, a quarter of that height of this beautiful, rich, you know, chocolate brown compost and that we can use instead of using organic uh, or chemical fertilizers we can use that to, to fertilize their crops just um, training that we do we've um, been offering um, training now to, uh, for the last sort of three or four years and you know it's been a challenge i have to say like just trying to get the buy up and the take up with the local community but what we've actually found is we've got the other ngos now that are actually looking to us to supply training for them and, and that's just been brilliant because it's sort of freed us up. We can do the training, we can train their leaders, and they become responsible for it. And then simply for us, we can just go and encourage them and see how they're going. So the, um, the building that they're standing in front of is the centre that um, I'll show you a little bit more about. Um, this, this is pre-COVID, actually. We went into the schools, and obviously children are really um, hungry to learn, and. Um, and it's actually part of the school curriculum that they have to do agriculture. So we are in a great place to teach. We've just taught in a couple of schools within Kasempa town. Um, and thus, these kids are just standing in front of this mighty maize crop, um, which they're about to harvest as fresh maize so they can put it on the um, barbecue and grill it and eat it. Uh, this is a family who have been very much involved with Foundations for Farming since I've been started since I've been there in 2016. Um, the lady standing next to me is in front of me is just as Mrs. Kibinda, and um, it's her husband on the other side. And she's only got five kids, but she looks after all these other kids. And her testimony for how Foundations for Farming has changed her life is just incredible. Um, you know, she wouldn't know where the next food or next meal was coming from for her family. Um, but now she's able to you know, feed her own family plus many other kids in the community. So she said, you know, her first year it wasn't so good. It was like 10 bags for one hectare, I think. And then the second year she got something like 50 bags, you know, and she was just, um, yeah, just totally full of the joy of the Lord, which just, uh, just praise God for. Um, nutrition and hygiene. So Mama Sawyer, this lady here, is my dear friend, Givness. Um, she, I've known her since 2009. Um, and she is just seen there, she's been making soya biscuits, and which she just sells um, on. But the soya biscuits are just things that the kids, that's just mainly made out of um, soya powder and maize meal. Um, and, you know, the kids love them, the adults love them, and uh, she earns a good income out of that. And the ladies on the right-hand side are just sitting there. Um, and in that bucket you see is actually soap mixture. And all that we need is just a bucket and a wooden spoon to make that. Um, and it's made out of uh, local cooking oil and uh, sodium hydroxide lye. So these groups of ladies now go out into the community. They sell the products um, that they've made, the soya, um, Soya products, there's soap on that lady's head, and then there's um, soya sweets and soya coffee and soya flour, which the mums can add to, to the, the porridge to feed their children. And then just, you know, teaching kids and um, how to wash hands. Um, whoops, go back one. Here, this was during COVID. Uh, as uh, The ladies as a team, we went round just to the local schools just to help educate them. The, the children there, the importance of washing hands, especially during COVID. Um, and then the training centre vision. So in 2020, hmm, December 2021, we started um, 
uh, building this centre, uh, local centre, we needed a place to call home. We needed uh, because most things were just being made and operated from my back porch in my house. So we needed something that was just going to be more sustainable, more long term, uh, long after I've gone. So um, wonderfully, um, a architect down in Picton um, for free designed this this training centre. Um, I gave her some initial drawings. And, um, and also she was a very generous, gave a generous donation of about $20,000 and we were able to get started. So we were able to purchase some land and that wasn't too far away from the hospital as well, which is great. Um, this is the team here and that land behind them is where you can see where it's cleared now on the uh, right hand side. But we first we needed to uh, put water down. Uh, we can't do building without water. Uh, but the blessing of that was that the community, and I didn't realise this, had to walk quite a long way to get clean water. And all of a sudden, within minutes, there were buckets, literally for Africa. <laughs> and people were just coming to get water. And so that's just been just a, a, an added bonus, you know, and to be able to bless the local community there. So you can see there that the... Um, the tank is a solar panel on top, and in that small brick shed is actually where the borehole is. So, yeah, that's our water. So we got started, um, yeah, in December 2020, yeah, 2021, and we got started uh, building, and then we're just building the first one arm of the, of the project. Um, we can see here we had actually had to purchase 6,000 bricks that were locally made <laughs> um, from just antil, you know, antil soil. Um, and yeah, that was a lot of bricks to purchase and a lot of bricks to truck in. Um, yeah, and this is just the guys just getting underway. You know, you see how physical this labour is. There's no, um, you know, there's no uh, cement making machine. There they are there just mixing their cement by hand. Um, lifting up 20 litres of cement to, to do the ring beam. Um, and you know, here they are, and they're just stacking away um, the bricks, just the chain gang. All right. So probably as of maybe a couple of weeks ago, this is just a very recent photo that's come in since I've been here. This is where we're at now. So we've got an ablution block on the end. We've got three classrooms or... Um, yeah, or just workshops, and um, even next month the kids kids are going to come and have a um, school holiday camp in this, this. So this is a place for the community to use, you know. So just a little bit of extra on the sidelines, life in the village and further afield. So for me, I really wanted to um, engage more with the community. I sort of live in a, well, I live in town, I live in a nice you know, three-bedroom house with running water and electricity. Um, here, uh, this is house is a six meter by six meter house. Um, no running water, no electricity. I do have a gas stove. Um, before I moved in there, I got the elders of the church to come and bless, and the deaconesses to come and bless it. Um, and the lady on the right hand side with the young girl, that's uh, the deaconess from my church, and it was her that gave me the land to build this house. Um, so this place is just, I don't know, it's the place I love, it's the place I feel at home. Been a real blessing. Um, one quick funny story I wanted to say with the 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 um, elders and the, the deacons. I made three very huge uh, cakes, uh, you know, just to have as a you know afterwards. And then I cut up half of them and then sort of dished them out. And then as they were leaving, the men were just sort of like putting the cake in their purse, all their bags, all pocket, and wrapping up and and leaving with it. And the ladies, two other ladies who was myself, were left, and they're like, ah. Oh, Vardy, they've taken all the cake, and so I was able to like to whip out you know the other half, and they'll like high five, you know. <laughs> but that's culture over there, you know. Like if you invite people to your house, what happens is that they um, will um, just if any leftovers, they'll take them home, and so you can't be offended. It's just the cultural difference, yeah. Mm. Next to, not far from that village house, is a group of young guys who have got themselves together to um, form a football team. And last year, uh, they managed to get themselves into the local finals, which was brilliant. 
Um, but most of these guys, they don't have jobs or any source of income. Drinking's a huge problem um, with the youth. Um, so much hopelessness, really, but, you know, these guys, um, yeah, just managed to sort of get in behind them and support them. They really need a lot of discipleship. Um, it's one of the things I've sort of been asking God, you know, show me or bring someone along that can just bring some sort of, like, discipleship materials and uh, just to really encourage them in their faith. I'm involved with the church youth group, uh, go to the local church, which is the local evangelical church in Zambia. Um, and it's a church that was birthed out of SIM um, way back, probably about 100 years ago. So, um, and they're just, you know, again, just so much, so vibrant, so full of energy, but just not much opportunity for them outside of, you know, village life. And the great outdoors, um, not a lot to do in Zambia, right out in the bush, but. Um, there's a couple of really neat hills to climb. The one on the left is just um, not far from where I live, and then it's not. Um, and the one on the right is about 60 kilometres, and it's like this 50 metre wall that you have to sort of scramble up. Um, quite scary, quite nerve wracking, not particularly safe, but nonetheless, it's it's fun. <laughs> yeah. And this is uh, just a group of us um, missionaries now. I can't if you can spot her in the back seat. Uh, the grey-haired lady there, Fran, she was just turning 80. She's been on the field for 50-plus years. Um, so we were just shouting her to a trip down to the game park and to this campsite and, you know, for fishing and just, yeah, seeing the wild animals. Um, so, yeah, this is the fun stuff you get to do if you come to Africa. You know, you get to do these fun things. And, oh, the kadoli. So I just wanted to show you, this is especially for the kids, maybe, you know, they don't have toys in, in Africa, but they're very ingenious when it comes to making toys. Um, so the little dolly um, on the left-hand side, they're both made, both made out of uh, plastic bottles. Um, obviously, the little girl found that doll's head, which looked like a Frankenstein doll. She had, like, stitches in her head. It was just quite scary, really. Um, and the other little girl, just a bit of braid from her hair, just for the, the head of this doll. So, yeah, quite amazing, really. Um, and the boys, they just love, and this is so iconic for Africa as well, they just love making wire trucks, wire bicycles, you know, wire buses. And this bus here, it's complete with the driver and even the name, Scorpion, which is the name of the local bus company that takes us to Lusaka and back. Um, yeah, these guys are amazing. And this, this was actually during, we went and did a project, we were just trying to go out and well, going out into the community and just trying to engage with parents and trying to engage them in their child's education and just say, you know, it's important for your children to play, you know, that's how children learn. So, oh, here we go, finally. So if anyone wants to go on the mission field, if you've got a heart for missions, feel free to join us with SIM um, or free if you don't want to, you want to go, if you want to give, feel free to, um, yeah, to go onto the website. I've also um, mm, put out just some cards out the back if you're um, interested in picking up one of these, um, one of these or one of these. One's for the project and one's sort of more personal, but one or the other. Um, yeah. um, oh. oh, I don't know how. I don't know. I must have got them in order. One of the things in, um, in Zambia is, well, where I'm living, there's not many uh, tradesmen around the place. And so you get called upon to, do, to be your own electrician, to be your own plumber, um, yeah, even a little bit of a mini mechanic if you possibly can. And so this was one December where our drains all blocked up and this is the septic tank and these are the things that I found in the septic tank. And yeah, so... Um, yeah, these are just daily life in Zambia <laughs> for us. Um, through there. So I was actually really encouraged this morning when I heard Jono just give that scripture. And um, yeah, when Jesus just, you know, just says that you must go and you must make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then I love this, you know, you can be sure that I'm always with you to the very end. And that's the comforting thing, that I know that God is with me when I'm out there. When I'm driving out there, when I'm in the rural remote place, there is nowhere else that I'd rather be than where I am. 
And what I can't understand is why there aren't so many more people out there doing this. It's a great life, it's an adventurous life. Sure, there are challenges, but um, it, life is just an adventure. So thank you.